بسم الله الرحمن الرحيم الحمد لله رب العالمين والصلاة والسلام على سيدنا وعظيمنا وحبيب قلوبنا وشفع نفوسنا أبي القاسم محمد وعلى أهل بيته الطيبين الطاهرين وأصحابه الغر الميامين الحمد لله الذي جعلنا من المتمسكين بولاية سيدي ومولاي علي بن أبي طالب الحمد لله الذي هدانا لهذا وما كنا لنهتدي لولا أن هدانا الله أما بعد يقول الله في كتابه الكريم بسم الله الرحمن الرحيم اقرأ باسم ربك الذي خلق خلق الإنسان من علق اقرأ وربك الأكرم الذي علم بالقلم علم الإنسان ما لم يعلم the first of our salawat in honor of Rasulullah Muhammad sallallahu alayhi wa alihi wa sallam. The second in honor of Amir al-Mu'mineen Ali ibn Abi Talib. The third with your loudest voices in honor of the Imam of our time, Imam Sahib al-Asr wa al-Zaman. There is a request for the brothers to come closer to the front. At the back, please come closer for those who are coming in. Salli ala Muhammad wa ali Muhammad. Allahumma salli ala Muhammad wa ali Muhammad. A little closer. There's no space there. Just a little closer. Thank you. Respected scholars, brothers and sisters, Salamu alaykum wa rahmatullahi wa barakatuh. If I was to call the Prophet Muhammad, peace be upon him and his family, a hysterical epileptic, many people would call this blasphemous. If I was to call him suicidal, many would call this scandalous. If I was to say that he was a person who was possessed by Satan, then many would say that this is a criminal statement. Sadly, these statements are all there when one examines the first revelation given to the Prophet, peace be upon him and his family. Indeed, you find that this particular incident highlights the clear difference between the Prophet Muhammad of the Shia and the Prophet Muhammad, peace be upon him and his family of any other school in Islam. Indeed, you find that the Shia would never ever come to a conclusion that the Prophet Muhammad, peace be upon him and his family, was a hysterical epileptic. Nor would we ever come to a conclusion that the Prophet Muhammad was suicidal, wanting to throw himself from the top of the mountain when he received revelation. Nor would any of us ever make the scandalous comment that the Prophet Muhammad was a person who was possessed by a demon or was insane. Yet you find every other school in Islam, in the Sira literature, reach these conclusions about when Surat Al-Alaq or the verses of Iqra were revealed about the Prophet, peace be upon him and his family. Because of these conclusions, you find that many non-Muslim scholars have tried to analyze whether the Prophet Muhammad had epilepsy or no. Would you believe not only the likes of the Byzantine or the Greek scholars such as Theophanes, but also a Russian novelist, for example, like Dostoevsky, discusses the epilepsy of the Prophet Muhammad, peace be upon him and his family. To the extent that some go as far as discussing temporal lobe and its relationship to the epilepsy of the Prophet Muhammad, peace be upon him and his family. They discuss this because they say that epilepsy can be seen when a person, for example, is someone who froths at the mouth, salivates, for example, convulsions occur, and so on. And therefore, this is what the hadith seemed to indicate happened to the Prophet Muhammad, peace be upon him, and his family. 
that the Prophet Muhammad, peace be upon him, his family, at the beginning of his mission, was a person who was hysterical, had a seizure affect him, and had to go back to his wife in a state of madness and a state of possession. If a non-Muslim reads this, then a non-Muslim will begin to ask us a number of questions. How could you believe in a man who he himself was uncertain about his own prophethood? Yes, as in you believe in this man as the final messenger of God, but the man himself goes through an epileptic seizure. That's why Hitchens, when he said that Muhammad was the epileptic plagiarist, was not far off because he used Bukhari and he used Muslim. And he used Tabari, and he used scholars such as Tayalisi amongst others, as well as contemporary scholars like Haikal, who say that the Prophet Muhammad went through an epileptic seizure when he received the first revelation. This is the difference between knowing about the Prophet Muhammad, peace be upon him and his family, from everybody else and knowing him from Al Muhammad. Salawatullah wa salamu alayhim. Yes. Allahumma salamu wa alayhim Muhammad. For many years, the Shia have been accused of not respecting the Prophet Muhammad, peace be upon him and his family. Have been accused of not honoring the Prophet Muhammad, peace be upon him and his family. Have been accused of not talking or discussing the Prophet Muhammad and his family. But no one can ever accuse the Shia of having the insulting claims that the Prophet Muhammad was a hysterical epileptic. Or that the Prophet Muhammad was affected by a seizure. Or that the Prophet Muhammad went back to Khadija who had to uncover herself to check if it was Jibra'il looking or Shaitan looking. Yes. In the seerah literature of the likes of Ibn Ishaq, Ibn Hisham, or the likes of Tabari, the likes later on of people like Haikal, there are certain things within the seerah literature which the Shia school is the only school in history which has stood up against or has denied. We all Muslims believe in one prophet, yes? No one denies that, that we believe in the Holy Prophet, peace be upon his family. But believe you me, there's a difference between the Prophet Muhammad, peace be upon him and his family, that I believe in and one that everybody else believes in. The Prophet Muhammad, peace be upon him and family, that I believe in was a man who would never go through an epileptic seizure when Jibra'il comes to him. Or who would never want to commit suicide and throw himself off a mountain because he couldn't believe the message that had come to him. Some people might look at this and say, is this really in the books of history? Yes, no doubt. Our debate in Islam is not about imama. The first debate was Tawheed and whether God has a body or he doesn't. The second debate was about the Prophet himself. Is he a man who is recognizing that he is a messenger of God? Or is he a man who doesn't have any knowledge that he is a messenger of God? Is he a man who is affected by the moral degradation of Arabia or not? As in even when the sacrilegious wars happened, the Fujjar, yes, no doubt he witnessed these wars take place. But he himself would not participate and pick up a sword. The witnessing of those wars, no doubt, was something that would remain with him forever. But even in those sacrilegious wars, when everyone throw themselves into it, he would be next to his uncle Abu Talib, trying to stand with his uncle alayhi salam. Likewise, the other moral degradation of Arabia doesn't affect him. It's unbelievable how Salman Rushdie, when he wrote the satanic verses, said, I used Bukhari and Muslim and this is what I wrote. Yes? Salman Rushdie was not bad off. He was saying to the Muslim world that the Muhammad who you believe in, if you really want to believe in this man, then there is no doubt that Satan can affect his verses. Yes? Because when you read, when Iqra' bism rabbika alladhi khalaq was revealed, Many Muslims, if you ask them, when Jibra'il came to the Holy Prophet, peace be upon him and his family, when he told him to read, what then happened? You'll find many Muslims will turn around and say, well, obviously the Prophet Muhammad read what Jibra'il asked him to recite. Yes, Jibra'il would have said to him, Iqra, he says, Iqra, and so on. If you were to turn around to Muslims and say, but do you know in your books it says that the Prophet Muhammad went crazy and they had to fight him and Jibra'il until Jibra'il overpowered him. And then the Prophet Muhammad said, I think I'm going to throw myself off a mountain. When you look at that, what do you find? You find that there are certain people who would be amazed. That, hold on a minute, the Prophet Muhammad wanted to commit suicide. But within the literature of all the other schools of Islam, you will find that this is there. Someone might say, what if it's in our literature? Even if it's in our literature, we'll delete it straight away. Because all of this type of stuff comes from where? 
The moment people went to a source other than the Thaqalain, other than the Quran and Ahlul Bayt, and when the likes of Anas bin Malik and Abu Huraira and wives and others started now explaining the religion, you found that this nonsense started to creep up within our religion. Yes. And that's why Christian evangelical scholars in America, the first argument they always have with any Muslim on the Prophet is, can you explain to me your Prophet the day he received his first revelation? Did he want to commit suicide or no? Many of us would turn around and say, what do you mean he wants to commit suicide? You must be joking. My prophet, he already knew that he's a prophet. He already knew about revelation. No, they turn around to you and they say, no, hold on. What, here in Tabari, it says that he seemingly wants to commit suicide. Can you explain that to me? Because they say Jesus never wanted to commit suicide. Moses never wanted to commit suicide. Abraham never wanted to commit suicide. The only person in Islamic literature who you find, and clearly there is Israeliyat entering the Islamic literature, where rabbis who converted to Islam started to slowly bring in tales into the Islamic literature, which started to blaspheme the Holy Prophet, peace be upon his family. Would you believe today, if you go to a country like Saudi Arabia and you say something insulting against Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa or his companions, you could be beheaded. Do you agree? In the same Saudi Arabia, in the bookshop, it says that my Prophet wanted to jump off a mountain when Wahi came to him. Tell me, isn't that more insulting than any other insult possible? For a person to say that the man who Allah chose as the Khatim of the Anbiya and the Mursaleen would be a man who at the age of 40 all of a sudden has a seizure. But there is an important point to note over here. That the Prophet Muhammad, if you imagine, reaches the age of 40. When Jibra'il comes to him, imagine Jibra'il has never come to him before. Isn't there a good chance that he could also lose his head? As in if Jibra'il has never been with him, never met him, he never knew about Jibra'il. You imagine your prophet was 40, he's never met any angel. If all of a sudden this big shining light comes to him in the mountain and says to him that you are the prophet of God. If you imagine that, that also seems difficult to comprehend. Wouldn't you agree? As in even if we say in the first 40 years of the life of the prophet, peace be upon his family, he was an impeccable character, a great character. Is being a great human enough for you to suddenly meet Gabriel? Because imagine today, you have a, a human being who's a great moral person. The moment he sees an, a huge angel, light, wings, surely he would be frightened. Unless there was a relationship way before 40. And that at 40 was he, when he was told to announce that relationship. Yes, And that's a fundamental issue for us to discuss. Therefore, you find that Muslims today, in their books, it says the Prophet Muhammad was a hysterical epileptic, a man possessed by Satan, but a man who Khadija had to go to a Christian priest of an Nestorian or an Ebionite origin, who told her, don't worry, don't worry, he's a prophet, there's nothing to worry about. Let me tonight examine the first revelation that came to the Prophet at the age of 40. In order for us to recognize why the seerah of Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi and the school of Ahl al-Bayt is purer than any other seerah in the religion of Islam. And why if it wasn't for Al-Muhammad, nobody would know Muhammad sallallahu alayhi wa alayhi wa sallam. Because I'm sick and tired of our people being bullied in being told that they do not honor Rasulullah in the way he should be, when it's really our literature that makes him a pure man. And the literature of others that allows people like Rushdie to write books like the Satanic Verses. Let's try and examine this in the following stages. Number one, what do the likes of Bukhari and Muslim and Tabari state happened to the Prophet when Wahi came to him? And what was the fight that happened between Jibra'il and the Prophet? And later... How does Khadija uncover herself so that she makes sure it's Jibra'il who came to the Prophet and not the devil? Number two, when other Prophets in the Quran received an angel, did they go crazy? Did they commit suicide? Or were they very calm? And if they were calm, then how comes the greatest of them would commit suicide? Number three, did the Prophet Muhammad have an angel with him from a young age? If not an angel... What's higher than an angel that we remember in Surah Al-Qadr every year? And how was Ruh Al-Quds with the Prophet wherever he would go? Yes. Number four, what other indications are given 
that shaitan could not affect him and that he knew that he was a prophet but he was waiting to announce that he was a rasul with a risala to mankind known as the quran number five did he re receive the quran in the 27th of rajab or in laylatul qadr and then why does the verse say inna anzalnahu fi laylatul qadr if the hadith say that he received the quran on the 27th of rajab Number six, how do the Imams of Ahlul Bayt say that that Ruh Al-Quds is with them as well? That whenever they make a decision, Allah allows the Ruh to be alongside them. And number seven, what were Yazid's famous words to Sayyida Zainab? Where he highlighted to her that I don't believe any revelation came to your granddad whatsoever. Let's try and examine this and dissect the topic in complete depth. When one reads a work like Tabari or Bukhari or Muslim or the works of someone like Tayalisi, you find that these are amongst the most revered scholars for our brothers and sisters in Ahl Sunnah. They revere them above everybody else and they revere who they narrate from. Normally they would narrate from the likes of whom? They narrate from the likes of Aisha, the wife of the Prophet. They narrate from the likes of Abu Huraira or they narrate from the likes of Anas bin Malik. This I call them the triumvirate. Yes. The triumvirate of Anas, Aisha and Abu Huraira have between them over 9,000 hadiths. Ali ibn Abi Talib has about 60. Over 9,000 hadiths between these three. Now these three no doubt dominate what happens when it comes to the life of the Prophet and our understanding of him according to Ahlul Sunnah. Imam al-Baqir of course tells us not to take from these three. Yes. Imam al-Baqir makes it clear that these are not people you take narratives from. Someone says, but sometimes you quote them. Yes, I quote them if they don't contradict an Imam. <laughs> if they say something and an Imam has said something, there's no contradiction, I quote. But otherwise, for me, I do not take from these three. However, they are clearly amongst those who tell us what happened on the night of what? On the night the Quran was revealed to the Prophet, peace be upon him, and his family. What do they say? Say that Rasulullah, as you know, used to go to the cave. Yes, Ghar Hara. He used to go there. And when he went there, on that night, the angel Gabriel came to him. The Prophet himself says, when the angel Gabriel came to me, he said to me, read. And I said to him, what do you want me to read? Read. What do you want me to read? What is there to read? And then he pressed me and he seized me. Until I, he said, Iqra bismi rabbika alladhi khalaq. He said, this was the day I was fearing. Yes. The day where I felt insanity or that Satan had affected me. I used to hate, listen to his words. I used to hate poets. And I used to hate those who were possessed by the jinn. And now I have to tell the Arabs that I have been given this message. I wanted to throw myself off the top of a mountain and kill myself. Yes. That's narrated where Tabari says that Rasulullah wanted to throw himself from the top of the mountain and kill himself. Yes. Haikal narrates this as well from Tabari. Haikal wrote, of course, about the life of the Prophet, peace be upon him, his family. And you found that he narrates this from Tabari. That Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa alayhi wa Jibra'il came to him, contemplated suicide. Suicide is an act of despair of this world. Yes, normally when a person commits suicide, he despairs either of the world that he lives in or he despairs of the, of the mercy of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. That's why in Islamic law, the greatest sin is shirk. Number one, polytheism. What's the second greatest shirk? Despair. Not adultery, not lying, not stealing, despair. Yes. Why? Because when you despair in your life, that means you are putting the power of the creator and the created on the same level. What do we mean? When I despair, say, I say to people, you know what? My life's never going to change. I have no luck whatsoever. No one can help me. That's the second greatest sin in Islam. Because when you say no one can help me, who else are you saying cannot help you? Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. So when a person comes to you and says, you know what? I'm definitely going to hell. No one's going to help me. No one's going to change me. That's it. That is the second greatest sin in Islam. A Muslim never despairs of the mercy of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. 
Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, any change, any second, is muqallib al-qulub, isn't he? He rotates the hearts of the human being. You found therefore despair results in suicide. In this narration, the indication is given that when Iqra was revealed, the Prophet Muhammad, peace be upon him, his family, wanted to jump off a mountain. That indicates, number one, that he despairs of the mercy of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Don't we agree? That at that moment, he had yes, and he had what we call qunut, despondency. In the Quran, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says, Ya ibadi alladheena asrafu ala anfusim, la taqnatu min rahmatillah. Never be despondent of the mercy of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Would the Prophet, peace be upon him and his family, be despondent of the mercy of Allah? Would he despair of the mercy of Allah? Because when Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa ta'ala quotes him as saying, that I'm going to jump off this mountain and kill myself. I ask all of you over here. In our lives, we've been through trouble sometimes. Have you ever once contemplated suicide? There are many normal human beings who will tell you, what do you mean suicide? Are you joking? Life is too short anyway. I want to make it shorter. Let me enjoy life, enjoy the thrills, enjoy the tests, enjoy the love, enjoy the different relationships. Now, us normal human beings wouldn't say that. Rasulullah on the top of a mountain, a prophet, who has in his 40 years been impeccable in his character, now says that I felt insanity and the possession of Satan on me. And now I thought to myself that I will jump off the mountain. This is in the books of our brothers from Ahlul Sunnah. As in many times people imagine the Rasulullah for us and for others is exactly the same. It's not the same. It's not the same. It's completely different conception. So what then does Rasulullah do? He goes home. Who does he go home to? Sayyidah Khadija, yes, he goes home to his wife. When he enters, she says, what's wrong with you? He said to her, you know what, Khadija, this happened to me. Jibra'il seized me. And remember, a few nights ago, we had mentioned that in another narration, Jibra'il opened his chest, washed his heart, and then Quran came down. Remember a few nights ago, we said that Tayalis in his Basran Isnad, which goes back to Aisha, says that Jibra'il was now a cardiologist and so on, and he'd done a surgery, mashallah. And he washed the heart of Rasulullah. So now Rasulullah comes to Khadija. He says to her, Khadija, Jibra'il just did this to me. And I want to commit suicide. I think this is the moment that I've been possessed. Yes. So Bibi Khadija says to him, do not worry. You're a good human. You help the poor. You help your neighbors. You help the needy. She begins to tell him that. When she begins to tell him that, one narration mentions something interesting. She says to him in one narration in the Sira literature, that Jibra'il, is he here right now? He says to her, what do you mean? She said, okay, come, sit on my left, the left of me. He comes to sit on the left. She says, is Jibra'il here? He says, yes. Come to the right of me. Is Jibra'il here? Yes. Come and sit in my lap. He comes to sit in her lap. Is Jibra'il here? Yes. She then uncovers herself. And says, is Jibra'il here? He says to her, no. She says to him, then Muhammad, that wasn't a devil. That was Jibra'il alayhi salam. Because Jibra'il, when I uncover myself, would not look at me in this way. Yes. That's in our literature. Within Ahl Sunnah's literature of the seerah. Says that Bibi Khadija uncovered herself. And I'm not surprised. If ever you want to see hadiths about when Jibra'il would come, for some reason, Aisha doesn't mind narrating that Jibra'il used to come when me and Rasulullah were in bed together. Yes. Within the literature, I, how many times have you read in the literature Aisha saying Jibra'il would come when me and the Prophet were together in bed? Yes. That's within the literature. And mind you, even if it's in our literature, I don't care. Delete this rubbish and this nonsense all straight away. So Khadija says, then Khadija says to him, do not worry. My cousin, my paternal cousin Waraka bin Nawfal, Let's go and see him to see if you're a prophet or not. <laughs> they go to Waraka bin Nawfal. If Waraka bin Nawfal knows you're a prophet, he might as well be a prophet. Waraka bin Nawfal, let's go and see him to see if you're a prophet. So it comes to Waraka bin Nawfal. What happened to you? He said, I was on, you know, in the cave of Hira, on the mountain, and Jibra'il came. And he said to me, read. I told him, what do you want me to read? Read. What do you want me to read? Read. What do you want me to read? Then he seized me and he pressed me hard. And he said, Iqra bismi rabbika ladhi khalaq. What is this? Is this Jibra'il? Have I been possessed? Can you tell me? He said, no. This is a namus al-akbar. This is the law of Allah being revealed to you. Do not worry. Go back up on the mountain tomorrow and tell me what happened again. Come back home and tell me. 
Now you find that Waraka bin Nawfal tells Khadija, oh Khadija, glad tidings. Your husband is the Prophet of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Yes. Therefore, within Ahl Sunnah's literature, the Holy Prophet, hysterical, epileptic, a seizure affects him. Then after that, what happens to him? He wants to throw himself off the mountain. Yes. When we mention this, we don't mention it to cause differences between Muslims. Just simply to highlight that the Shia understanding of Rasulullah is on a completely different level to any other school in Islam. Yes. When this is revealed, many people look at it and say, hold on, so you're saying my prophet was a hysterical epileptic who wanted to commit suicide. So, well, it's in the books, they narrate it. Okay, let's look at, firstly, let's look at the other prophets of Allah. When revelation came to the other prophets of Allah, did any of them become hysterical or want to commit suicide? Who do you want me to begin with? Let's say, for example, we begin with someone like Nabi Musa alayhi salam. Nabi Musa, imagine you hear a voice from a burning bush. Automatically, you may think to yourself, hold on, what's going on here? Straight away, he recognizes this is a message from his Lord. His Lord then tells him, what's that stick that you have? He begins to tell him the usage of the stick. You all know the story in Surah 20 from verse 20 onwards. What's the stick in your hands? I push the stick on the leaves so for my sheep. Raise your hands. He begins to tell him about what his mission is. Does Nabi Musa reply, oh my God, I'm possessed. I'm insane. I hear voices. I'm about to go crazy. An angel is destroying me. Simple reply from Nabi Musa alayhi salam. What is it? Rabbi shrahli sadri wa yassirli amri wa hlul uqdatan min lisani yafqahu qawli wa jalli waziran min ahli. Harun akhi. Ishtud bihi azri. Look, you're just so calm. Oh my Lord, expand my chest for me so I can bear this message. And also do what? Rabbi Shalli make my affairs easy. Loosen the knot from my tongue. Yes. So that I may be easy to understand. Make a successor for me from my family. My brother Harun, make him my backbone for me. Does Musa suddenly convulse? Yes. Does Musa salam, say that now I should throw myself from a mountain? Does Musa salam, have an epileptic fit? Not at all. Let's look at another prophet. Nabi Ibrahim salam, when the dream comes to him that he must sacrifice his son. Does he have a seizure or does he realize? Oh my son, I see in my dream that I must sacrifice you. What's your opinion? My father, do what you've been commanded to do. You will find me as one of the patient ones. Ibrahim, Musa, Nuh, others. Never once you read. That any of them went through an epileptic seizure, any of them went through convulsing, any of them went through, for example, suicidal acts. Let's look at people who received Jibra'il who weren't prophets of God. Maryam, alayhi salam. Did Jibra'il visit her? Maryam, when he bought her the fruits in the summer and the winter, yes? He bought her the summer fruits in the winter and the winter fruits in the summer, according to the Holy Quran. He came in the form of a human being. At the beginning, she just said to him, how could you enter upon me like this? Then when he says to her, I am a messenger from your Lord, did Maryam suddenly jump from the chambers down six floors and kill herself? No. At the end of the day, these who Allah instills within them, humbleness and sincerity. Allah opens their soul, so their soul recognizes divine truths. Musa's mom, she knows the revelation has come to her in the form of inspiration when the Quran says, Wa ila ummi Musa and Did she suddenly say, I'm getting Satan possessing me, he's talking to me? No. I know there's a voice from Allah telling me, put your baby in the basket and roll him down the river Nile. If all of these messengers who came before the Prophet, peace be upon his family, none of them when they saw Jibra'il went crazy. None of them when they heard the voice of Allah went crazy, had a seizure, were suicidal, were so on. So where did these hadiths come from that my prophet, the greatest prophet of God, suddenly wants to commit suicide? Yes. Where do these come from? These come from people who wanted to taint the image of the prophet so that their beloved leaders who were sinners were made to sound similar to Rasulullah. Yes. When you lower from Muhammad, you can raise from the status of others. Yes, no doubt. No doubt. When I come to my lecture on the infallibility of the prophet, and the questions in the Quran about whether he's masoom or not. I will show you how there was a movement that the more we can show Muhammad as a man who makes mistakes and errors, when others make mistakes, we can say, but their prophet made a mistake. 
I'll never forget in a debate on one occasion, a person said to me, what's wrong with Muawiyah? I said to him, what do you mean? What's right with Muawiyah? You know, tell me something which is right, then I'll tell you what's wrong. He said to me, Muawiyah, what's wrong? I said, listen, Muawiyah fought Ali. Now you claim you love Ali. You say he's your fourth Khalifa. You go crazy if someone tells you that you don't love him. Okay, you love him. Aisha against him, no problem. Muawiyah against him, no problem. He said to me, you're okay, Muawiyah made a sin. I said, is that all? He said, yes. If Adam could sin, why can't Muawiyah? Look where the mind goes. If Adam could sin, why can't Muawiyah? Because what happens is when you go into a world where the prophets are sinners, that means later on Umayyah's lords can be sinners as well. If Yazid kills Imam al Hussein, well, Muhammad felt suicidal, so maybe Yazid went a bit delirious as well on one occasion. Yes. They start to make equations like this. Whereas in the school of Ahlul Bayt, question arises the Holy Prophet, peace be upon him, his family, was he suicidal on that occasion or not? Yes. Firstly, what do we say? Firstly, we say the Prophet himself knew that he was a prophet. While Adam was between water and clay. Okay. Already in the pre-eternal world, Rasulullah had already known. Secondly, when you were brought up in the house of Abdul Muttalib and brought up in the house of Abu Talib, for goodness sake, your grandfather was a man who when Ashab al-Fil were trying to attack Mecca said that I want my camels, the Kaaba has its own Lord. When you were brought up in a house with that much tawakkul in Allah, why would you lose tawakkul at this stage, number two? Number three, in the school of Ahlul Bayt, we believe that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala would put an angel before the Prophet and an angel after the Prophet, guarding him at a young age. Yes. Numerous hadiths of the Imam say that Rasulullah from a young age, Allah had sent angels to guard him. In Quran, we find that I in Surah 72 verse 26 to 27. رسول فإنه يسلك من بين خلفه yes. من بين يديه ومن بين خلفه رصدا. You find that the Quran says that Allah subhanahu wa taala says that He has knowledge of the unseen. None has that access to that knowledge except a messenger, and that there is a person guarding from the front من بين يديه ومن خلفه رصدا. That there is an angel who guards at the front, an angel who guards from behind, meaning that in his young age. The angels were already guarding him. Not just the angels, but higher than the angels. Yes, there is a creation of Allah, which is known as Ruh Al-Quds. Yes. In Surah Al-Qadr, we say, إِنَّا أَنزَلْنَاهُ فِي لَيْلَةِ الْقَدْرِ وَمَا أَدْرَاكَ مَا لَيْلَةُ الْقَدْرِ لَيْلَةُ الْقَدْرِ خَيْرٌ مِنْ أَلْفِ تَنَزَّلُ الْمَلَائِكَةُ وَلْ The angels descend, but who else? The Ruh. The Ruh is this light between Allah and the Prophets and the Imams of Ahlul Bayt, yes? That Ruh is that light which is alongside the Prophets of Allah and the Imams of Ahlul Bayt. They asked our fourth Imam, when, how do you judge a decision legally? He said, by the laws of Allah. But if we are in a state where there is a difficult verdict, the Ruh is always next to us to provide us with the answer for it, yes? Allah has chosen the Ruh to be with the Prophet and with the Imams of Ahlul Bayt wherever they go. That Ruh provides a guidance for them, is next to them, is a protector for them. Yes, otherwise, if someone says, What do you mean? You say, Quran says, Tanazzalul malaikatu wa ruh. Yes, wa ruh. When it says wa ruh, what is a ruh? Malaikas, angels. A ruh, some said Jibrail, not Jibrail, no. A creation higher than Jibrail alayhi salam. Yes. That's there as a column of light between Allah and the Prophet, peace be upon him and his family. Further than that, at the age of 37, Rasulullah himself says that I, in my dream, I saw Jibra'il telling me that you are the Prophet of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. And then it was only a matter of waiting for when Jibra'il would tell me that now I go out to announce to the world about what I already knew from a young age. Okay? Rasulullah from a young age had met Jibra'il, had met Israfil, had angels around him. The Ruh was alongside him. Yes. All of these were alongside him. He was already meditating. Why would you go to a cave which only overlooks the Kaaba? You alone. Why? Why? Why would he choose Ghar Hara? Those of you who have been to Hajj, you've gone up all the way to Ghar Hara. You've sat in the Ghar Hara where you could see the Kaaba. Why would he do that? A man 
would go up there who doesn't know Allah, doesn't know he's a prophet of Allah, doesn't know there's a time to meditate and to remember his Lord. His Lord wouldn't know when to communicate to him. The Lord who could speak to Jesus while Jesus was a baby could not speak to Muhammad in his teens. Yes. The Lord who inspires Jesus to say, I'm a servant of Allah when he was just born cannot inspire the Holy Prophet, peace be upon his family. For goodness sake, Nabi Isa when he's born says, I am a servant of Allah. And you think the Holy Prophet didn't know he was a servant of Allah from the day of his birth. But, an Abi, yes, a Rasul, when the Risala is given to him. So what then do we say happened? What happened was very simple. Rasul Allah, like any other day, goes to Ghar Hara, goes to Hara cave, and he speaks to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, communicates, recites his prayers, yes. And you find as well, that while he is reciting his prayers and communicating to Allah, Jibra'il comes to him. He says to him, recite. And he says to Jibra'il, what would you like me to recite? And he says, Bismillah ar-Rahman ar-Rahim. Iqra' bismi rabbika alladhi khalaq. And he says, Iqra' bismi rabbika alladhi khalaq. Khalaq al-insana min alaq. Khalaq al-insana min alaq. Iqra' wa rabbuka al-akram. Iqra' wa rabbuka al-akram. Alladhi allama bil... Yeah, the first five verses of the Quran to be revealed to the Prophet. The moment he said that, he said to him, Ya Rasulullah, of course, before he began recital, he got some water out from the ground for him to do wudu. He recited the Quran and then he said to him, Glad tidings to you, O Muhammad. Ashadu an la ilaha illallah wa ashadu anna Muhammadan Rasulullah. Allah. A second louder salawat if you don't mind. Third in honor of Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa alayhi. From that moment onwards, he said to him, glad tidings to you, O Prophet of God. Look at the difference. In the other version, he's punching, boxing ring, mashallah, fight and so on. In this version, you find that he says to him, glad tidings to you, O Prophet of God. There is only one God, and Muhammad is the messenger of God. At that moment, he turned around and he went from Hara. Naturally, there was a burden now of the beginning of the message. If there are traditions that give an indication about a weight of expectation, that's understood. Listen, we can have the smallest responsibility from work and you have a little sweat come down. Imagine the responsibility of being the last guide to mankind. Yes. You would find that at that moment, what would happen? He goes back to Khadija. Khadija looks at him. She says, what is that light that shines from your face, my husband? Do you know in the Sira literature how it makes Khadija sound? Khadija not only uncovers herself, as we said, but in the other Sira literature, it says that Khadija, when she wanted to get married to the Prophet, she got her dad drunk so he would accept Rasulullah. And Haikal says that Khadija, when she loses her children, beseeches idols for help. Look at the Khadija of the Ahl al-Bayt and Khadija of any other school. Shall I tell you something? If it was another wife of Rasulullah and we said these things, they would kill us today. But it's Khadija. Who cares? If you said that about someone else, they will cause an avalanche. But Khadija, no. Khadija got her dad drunk. Khadija besieged idols. Khadija uncovers her skirt so Jibrail to see if Jibrail is there or no. Yes. That Khadija, when she saw Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa what did she do? She said, what is that light that shines from your face? He said to her, Khadija, the news has come to me to begin the message now. Yes. And she could see that obviously that bearing of seeing Jibrail telling him to begin, she comes and she covers him. Come sit next to me. Does she go to her cousin and say, hey, by the way, can you come and do an analysis, a prognosis, please? Just check up that there's a new heart which got washed um, and check the water if you don't mind and if the uh, knife was used was clean as well, if you can as well. That's how fortunate we are to have had Imam al-Baqir and Imam al-Sadiq. Believe you me. Believe you me, were it not for Imam al-Baqir and Imam al-Sadiq giving the world the real Rasulullah, we would have the Rasulullah of epilepsy and hysteria and delirium, yes? And I'm not surprised of a Rasulullah of a school in delirium when the leader of that school called him delirious.
Anyway, so when you have this, you found that this person, Rasulullah, does not need waraka to confirm. From that day onwards, who were the ones who believed in that message? Rasulullah, with him Khadija, with him Imam Ali. Then Abu Talib saw the three of them praying. He was with young Ja'far. Ja'far was who? Was the younger brother of Imam Ali alayhi salam, yes? Or the, the older brother of uh, Imam Ali alayhi salam. Of course, the first was Talib, then Aqil, then Ja'far, then Ali. You found that Abu Talib told Ja'far, Ja'far, go and pray with your cousin Muhammad. And pray with your brother. And pray with Khadija. And they all would be the first group of Muslims who would come next to Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa alayhi. They had no doubt whatsoever in the prophethood of Rasulullah. They had no doubt that he was a man who was hysterical or in epilepsy. This is all nonsense. Would never come into their mind. To them, this man was sadiq and ameen for 40 years. Impeccable in a society that was a jungle. Why now would he lose his head? Yes. And that's the sadness of Islamic history. That we have people who call the prophet. And now this is taught in schools, by the way. There are madrasas around the world that teach their kids when Iqra was revealed. So Rasulullah, he wanted to jump off on a mountain and kill himself. Yes. And these children are brought up believing our prophet is like this. Interestingly, you find... That the first words to be revealed to him became the meaning of the religion, which is what? Education and literature. Iqra. Because then the second surah that's revealed later to him is what? Qalam. The pen and reading. No doubt Rasulullah wanted his community to be a literate community. Education is fundamental in this religion. Iqra is recited twice in this surah. Iqra bismi rabbika alladhi khalaq. Khalaq al-insana min alaq. Iqra again. The importance of education, sadly, the school of Ahlul Bayt has become a school where there is no reading amongst its followers. There are followers of Ahlul Bayt. Imam Sadiq calls them orphans. Someone said to Imam, what do you mean? I have a dad, I have a mom. He said, no. An orphan is not one without a mother or father. An orphan is one without literature. Yes, That's an orphan. Not one without a mother or father. A Shi'i, Imam Sadiq would say, either spreads knowledge Gains knowledge or is an absolute waste of space. Three types of Shia. The one who disseminates knowledge. The one who seeks to gain knowledge. And the third, absolute waste of space. Don't count them amongst us. Because a Shia never stops reading. Always. And in the world today, subhanAllah, in the time of Rasulullah, we never had Amazon, Amazon Kindle, Amazon Plus, Amazon Minus. We never had these things. In the time of Rasulullah, Iqra recite. A couple of people learned how to read and slowly education began to grow. Today, you can on a flick of a button read a whole book about the life of Rasulullah, about the lives of Ahlul Bayt, about the laws of Islam, the ethical precepts of the religion, the theological principles of the religion. A religion from the beginning, the Quran said, Iqra bismi rabbika. Why rabbika? Why not Iqra bismi khaliq? Why not Iqra bismi Allah? Why Iqra bismi rabbik? Why rabb? Why not Allah? Why not khaliq? Why not another attribute? The Arabs used to believe that the khaliq of everything was Allah. But they believe that once Allah created everything, he left the power to the idols and to the jinn and to other things. Here the Quran said, Iqra bismi rabbik alladhi khalaq. A rabb is the khaliq, but rabb also means the one who nourishes you and allows you to grow. Meaning, Allah did not just create us and leave us to idols. Allah didn't create us and leave us to jinn. Allah created us and nourished us. And at the beginning it says, Iqra bismi rabbika alladhi khalaq, khalaq. Hold on a minute. First it says, read in the name of your Lord who created. Created. Why mention created twice? The first one is am. Read in the name of your Lord who created everything. Then, al khas, khalaq al insan. He created man. From what? Min alaq, from a leech-like clot. You know what's beautiful about saying that? Muhammad, there's too many arrogant Arabs who aren't going to listen to you. Remind them that I created them from a leech-like clot, yes? Ali ibn Abi Talib doesn't say, mankind, you came from a drop of semen and you leave as a piece of dust. You don't know when you came and you don't know when you're going. So why do you walk around like you know everything? Yes? That's how the Quran wanted to instill from the beginning. That man was created from what? From leech-like knot. 
that these Arabs are going to remind them, I'm their creator, I'm their nourisher, I have not left them, and that I created them from a leech like Lot. Iqra wa al akram. Your Lord is not generous, the most generous. Kareem is generous. El, when there's El before, that's a sifa of afdaliya, the most generous. He has given you, Muhammad, everything, whether you wanted it or not, asked for it or not, and others as well. He gives them whether they're religious or not, whether they love him or they don't, whether they worship him or they don't, whether they wake up for their salah or they don't, he never stops giving them. He is not Kareem. Iqra wa rabbuk al akram. Kareem, me and you are Kareem. But you know the difference between our karama and the akram? When I'm Kareem to someone, I want him to do something for me. Whereas Al-Akram gives without wanting anything back in return. Yes. And with me, I give to people who have done well for me, I'll help them. People I don't know, I won't. Yes. Whereas Al-Akram helps those who say that he does exist and those who say he doesn't exist. That's Al-Akram. From the very beginning, every word in the Quran had a meaning. On that night, when was it? Was it Shahar Ramadan or was it Rajab? Now, some people say, hold on, it says, Inna anzalnahu fi laylatil. And Laylatul Qadr means that the Quran was revealed. Shahr Ramadan, Alladhi Unzila Fihil. We say there's a difference between Inzal and Tanzil of the Quran. The Quran revealed in stages was beginning 27th of Rajab. That is when Surah Al Alaq was revealed. The first day of the Prophethood of Rasulullah was the 27th of Rajab. Yes. Someone says, so how about Shahr Ramadan? Shahr Ramadan is when the whole Quran was infused into the heart of Rasulullah. Which means that what? Why would you have a step-by-step -step process and a night for the whole heart? Step-by-step -step because as things are developing, you are revealing ayah by ayah. When you need those ayahs, you press the hard drive and the ayah comes out straight away. Yes. So that when the angel gives it to you, you already have it infused in your heart. But if you give a community the whole Quran in one day, no one's going to understand it. If however, as the community grows with you, verses keep coming down. 27th of Rajab, the first day of the Prophethood of the Prophet. Shahar uh, Laylatul Qadr is when the whole Quran was revealed into the heart of Rasulullah. The 27th of Rajab is when it was revealed step by step until 23 years later. Therefore, does the school of Ahlul Bayt come forward and say that the Prophet had an epileptic seizure? No. Suicidal? No. A man who fought in sacrilegious wards to kill others? Not at all. A man whose wife made her father drunk or who uncovers her skirt? Not at all. And that's all credit to the Imams of Al Muhammad. But you would find that that wahi to Rasulullah would be something many Muslims would believe in, except the Khalifa who sat in Sham. Yes? Because when Sayyidah Zainab السلام, stood in front of Yazid, he wanted to recite poetry in front of her. Which poetry did he recite? The most famous lines of poetry. Later, what does he say? I wish my disbelieving ancestors, I wish my ancestors from Badr were present in Sham today. Who's his ancestors at Badr? Firstly, those who, when Zakir Naik said Yazid radiallahu anh in Bombay a few years ago, yes? Who's his disbelieving ancestors? Who's his ancestors? Utbah bin Rabi'a, the father of his mom, of his grandmother Hind, yes? Was the leader of the soldiers against Rasulullah on the day of Badr. Yazid says later, I wish my ancestors from Badr could see what I've done to Hussein's head over here. Because he would poke the eyes of Abi Abdullah. And he would play with the lips of Imam al Hussein alayhi salam. The same lips which Rasulullah used to touch. And the same eyes that used to look at Rasulullah. Yes. And whose father used to smell the fragrance of Nubuwa when Nubuwa first came. Yes. You found that he would poke the lips and the eyes and say, I wish my ancestors from Badr were present to see what I have done. And then he concludes it by saying, Hashim played with a monarchy. There was no news and there's no wahi. Yazid radiallahu anh. Is that what Zakir Naik says? 
Yazid himself says there's no wahi. La'ibat Hashim. Bani Hashim. La'ibat Hashim bil mulk. Fala khabarun jaa wala wahyun. There was no news. There's no wahi. Everything that that lady says is nonsense. There was no Jibra'il. There's no Muhammad and his revelation. The man is possessed. The man's got nothing to do with this religion. And that's literally the movement of Bani Umayyah. Bani Umayyah tried to move Rasulullah out of the picture. Yes. They tried their hardest. And if they couldn't remove Rasulullah, they made sure they removed the grandson of Rasulullah. And how did they remove him? I tell you, one of the poets says, we can understand striking a man with a sword. We can understand poisoning a man. But to make your horses trample his body, surely this is not even within the Arabs and the way the Arabs behave. Yes, even the Jahiliyyah never had such a concept when they used to fight their sacrilegious wars. But above all of that, they wanted to add an insult to him. Make him die thirsty and not touch the water. And the morals of the man when he used to get to the water were phenomenal. That you would think he's so thirsty, he would drink. Yet he turned around and he saw his horse thirsty. And he said, how can I drink water when my horse is thirsty next to me? Imagine those morals, yes? How many people would have drunk water there and then? How can I drink from the water of the Farat while my horse stands there thirsty with no water given to him? Imagine that level of morals. And it was that thirst that he kept on saying to his Shia, that whenever you drink water, remember my thirst, yes? Whenever there is a cold or a hot day and you're coming near that water, remember the thirst of Abi Abdullah. That's number one. Whenever you're asking for a hajjah from Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, always say the following lines. Ya Allah, I ask you in the name of the thirst of Abi Abdullah, answer my dua. That's especially... That dua is answered. But then also another line. Ya Allah, I ask you in the name of the ghurbat of Abi Abdullah. Yes, in the name of the strangerhood of Abi Abdullah. That every man may be a stranger. But there's no stranger like Abi Abdullah. When he stood alone to face the army of Umar bin Sa'ad. That affected whom? It affected Imam Zain al Abidin alayhi salam. When uh, Imam Zain al Abidin after Sham returned to Medina, one day in the middle of the night he was walking in the street. Uh, he saw a man who was sitting there on the street and the man was calling, Ana al Hajjan, Ana al Gharib. The man was calling, I am thirsty, I am a stranger. The Imam came and sat by him. He said to him, Oh man, are you thirsty? He said to him that I am. He said to him, Oh man, I heard you say that you are a stranger. He said to him, Yes, I am. He said, Is it because you have no family next to you? He said, No, I do. He said to him, Is it because you have no one to bury you? He said, No, Alhamdulillah. When I die, there is someone to bury me. The tears begun to roll from the eyes of the Imam. He said to him, Oh man, then don't call yourself a stranger. Stranger. A stranger is a man who has no water when he lays on the ground. A stranger is a man whose body lies on the ground for three nights with no one to bury it. Oh man, there's only one stranger. My father, Abi Abdullah, is the only stranger you can ever talk about. He lay for three nights with no one to bury his own. <laughs> ya Allah, raise us with Muhammad and Al Muhammad. Allow us to be amongst the companions of the Imam of our time, Imam Sahib Al Asri was Zaman. Allow us to receive the Shafa of Muhammad and Al Muhammad. We pray to Allah Subhanahu wa Taala for our brothers in Yemen in Iraq, in Syria. Ya Allah, remove the dhulm that exists over there. We pray to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala with the Surah Al-Fatiha, but before it, the loudest of your salawah.